So two weeks ago at our middle schoolers football game, the dot came over from the sideline to the stands and said, William looks to have had a concussion, so he's done for the night. And tomorrow you need to get him to the doctor. He's always had a strong arm all his life and always played quarterback, but in the recent year or two, he's, he's had a nice growth spurt to the 99th percentile of boys his age. So now he plays middle linebacker also. Quarterback and middle linebacker. It's probably not a sustainable model, but it's fun for now. So I looked at him and said, well, gosh, son, are you feeling confused? He said, I'm just confused about how bad our team stinks tonight. I knew he hadn't lost all touch. So driving home a little bit later, things were quiet and he confessed, Dad, I just felt so angry that they had scored on us, that when that guy came running towards me, I was like, oh, you are gonna pay for this one. And I lowered my helmet like I know we're not supposed to. And bam. Well, the next day after finishing the impact process at Think Neurology, Dr. Varghese, a wonderful neurologist and a faith bridger, sat down with us and said, it was a minor concussion. It's gonna feel normal in a couple more days. We were grateful. But why would I tell you that story? Because I think in a very real way, it's feeling like people all around are getting mighty angry and they're lowering their heads and charging headlong into others with the intent to bring pain. And I'm not talking about the non-Christians. I'd expect that. I'm talking about the Christians, the believers, the brothers and sisters who are just knocking each other back, if not in person, certainly on their social platforms. In the recent months, it's, it's like political tensions and economic concerns and COVID and racism and name calling. It's like all those things have been thrown into the same stew pot and cranked up on high and things are boiling over now. But you know, this is nothing new. In fact, one of the reasons Jesus' half-brother James wrote the letter we've been studying this fall is because even back then, Christian brothers and sisters were doing the same thing, fighting and quarreling and coveting and bickering and wanting their way, and if they couldn't get their way, killing each other, if not physically, certainly through slander, verse 411 tells us, and killing the self-esteem or the feelings or the reputations of others. So what James says to them is entirely relevant for us today. So look in your Bible now, and we're going to journey through James chapter 4, starting with verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires or your passions that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. James sounds a lot like a lot of moms and dads I know. I'm sure if your kids are like mine, they can get on each other's nerves and they can say snarky things to each other. And if you've got boys like we do, well, boys, they can get downright physical and wrestle. And sometimes the wrestling turns to blows. And when they cross that line and start going for blood, I have to jump up, march in, and remind them, hey, you and you. We're on the same team. We're Team Whirline. Don't forget it. Now go to your rooms and cool off. You're done. But sometimes, gloriously, I'll happen by the both of them sitting together and actually overhear one helping the other with his homework or even one praying for the other. And I whisper with the psalmist, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Nothing, nothing makes me happier. Because isn't that the way it's supposed to be in the homes where we live? And in the home of God's people called the church, the family of God? So if you're a note taker, the first of three observations that we're gonna to make today from our text is this. When there's fighting on the team, the team will never function. Remember what Jesus prayed in John 17, 21 through 23, that we, the believers, that we would be one, that we would be unified because he knew, Jesus knew that if sinners who've been saved by grace were brought into a new community where they experienced care 
for one another and love for one another and encouragement for one another. Something wonderful and unique from the rest of the world would compel others on the outside looking in to say, please, could I come in? I want to experience that sort of transformation in my life too. It's what my soul's been longing for. Look at them. The world said of those early Christians, even when they disagree about worldly things, behold how they love one another. But today, why would anybody expecting love or hope or grace turn to us if all they hear from us Christians is divisiveness and judgment and anger? See, when that happens, church, we're trampling on the one thing that he prayed for us there in John 17, which would make us irresistible to the world. Spinoza was a 17th century philosopher, and he put it this way, how is it that these Christian people, supposedly characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness to all, should quarrel with such rancorous animosity and bitter hatred towards each other? You wanna spot a Christian, he said? Look for the group of people fighting each other. That was no compliment. Not back then, not now. So what was causing all the strife in the early church that James was writing? The same thing that's causing it today. James is telling them, you're fighting each other because of your selfish desires. That word in verse one, desires or, or passions in the ESV, it's a key word. In the original language, it's the word hedone, from which we get the word hedonism. What's hedonism? Hedonism is the pursuit of any pleasure that I want. I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it. It's all about me. So here's the thing. All of us, we have good decoy strategies. You and I are great at casting blame, not on us, but on the government, or on our parents, or on our rivals, or on bad luck, or bad economy, or the bad tides of history, or the vagaries of fate. But come on, James is saying the problem is inside of you. You want what you want when you want it the way that you want it. Sort of like the faith bridger who sent me an email last week. I think he probably just needed a big hug, but instead <laughs> he wrote me all about it. Politics, Republicans, Democrats, the media, the devil, everything that was on his mind. And then when he got to COVID, he, he, he said this. He said, I'll be honest with you, Pastor Ken. Personally, I think that you and all the pastors should just say the heck with it. We're ripping off our masks. You can wear a mask if you need one, but don't ask me to wear one for your sake. And he continues. Now, I'm aware that this might not be congruent with what Jesus would be doing if he were alive today. But still, I'm telling you, this is how you ought to be doing it. <laughs> I chuckled, but then my heart sank because I realized I've been your pastor all these years and your walk with Christ is still this stunted? American hedonism and the body of Christ, the church, those two things don't go together because the church was never about our wants or our rights. The church is about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The church is a composition of people who by grace have turned from their selfish, hedonistic ways and stepped into the community of the saved, gathered around our Savior and daily surrendering our self-will over to him, the Lord who guides our daily living. Oh, friends, when we get this right, when we live the way of Christ, our caring qualities are contagious and everything around us changes for the good and people step towards us. But when a believer slips back into hedonism, putting their passions or perceived needs ahead of others, everything gets infected, including your prayer life. And that's where James is gonna go in verse three. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. 
Oh, there's plenty of people who are willing to say, come on, God, get with the program, because if you won't, I will, myself. I'll just take over, as if the king of the universe would say, oh, well, in that case, yes, sir, I'll get right on that one. But why would God answer that prayer? What glory would he get out of that? We pray for God to bless our lives financially or socially or politically in many other ways. And when it doesn't happen on our timetable, what do we do? We say, come on, God, get with the team, team awesome. And he's like, uh, no, because he says, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. You get on my team, team Jesus. Brothers, sisters, prayer is not about my will be done. Prayer is about surrendering ourselves to him and his will and saying, thy will be done. But when we don't do that, you know what's at the root of it? He continues, verse four. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. What's he saying? Second observation if you're a note taker. He's saying disunity among team Jesus is always going to stem from our confused loyalties. At the most foundational level, James is saying, you've fallen in love with the world. He's saying we, the church, the bride of Christ, that's who we are, we're the bride of Christ, and, and therefore he is the groom. And, and we should be committed solely to him. That's how a healthy marriage is, right? And when we're not focused solely on him, what's he saying? He's using a fair language. He's saying it's because you're having an affair with the world. You've slipped into the world. You've loved the world too much. You're finding too much of your self-worth and your satisfaction and your fulfillment, not in me, the Lord, but in the world. You're committing spiritual adultery. It's like you've hopped in bed with the things of the world. That's strong language, like a two by four to the forehead. <clears throat> you know, he's saying, hey, wake up. You cannot declare, Lord, I love you. You're my all in all. But would you mind if I, uh, if I had a date over here with um, money? Because <laughs> she's pretty cute, money is. But don't get me wrong, Lord, <laughs> you're, you're number one. One moment. Um, I've been meaning to get popularity's number because she gets a lot of likes and you wouldn't mind if I go for a few likes, right? But, but, but still, you're number one. I'll be right back. When believers get entwined with the world, everything goes sideways. And I'm, I'm telling you, this is where I'm really seeing believers stumbling. Politics. Relax. Don't worry. I love our country. I love our freedoms. I love America's history. I love that we get to vote. I love that Faith Bridge is going to be a voting place for the first time on November 3rd, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I've loved the many years of fireworks extravaganzas that we've held here at Faith Bridge on July 4th with 40 buses shuttling people to and from the outlying parking lots. And maybe one day we'll get to do it again if we can figure out how, how to accommodate the crowd sizes that we were getting uh, towards the end where it was getting a little bit away from us. But look, I know in this season, I know how many of you are worked up and angry worried at the idea of Biden becoming our next president, and what that might mean for our nation. And I also know how many others of you are worked up and angry and scared of what the tone of our nation might become with four more years of President Trump. Trust me, I've, I've, I've read all of your heartfelt, passionate, sometimes angry letters on both sides, reminding me why your candidate is, is, the, is the more biblical candidate on abortion or racism, traditional sexuality and marriage, care for the poor, law and order, concern for the immigrant, matters of character, 
integrity. I get it. I think some of you may have forgotten. I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. Remember, I'm the son of a federal judge who was appointed by President George H.W. Bush. I sat with my mom and sister behind dad at his Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, just like Amy Coney Barrett's family sat behind their mom. Uh, Dad's was back in 1992 when we went into that Senate chamber and his dad sat at the desk to be questioned by the senators. And by the way, if you want a little trivia, guess who chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee back in 1992? Joe Biden. So I grew up in a home where many an evening the Wurlines family conversation revolved around politics. I'm not naive on this subject, but neither am I worried about November 3rd because I know something you couldn't know unless you've sat as pastors do with people as they die and reached up with your thumb and closed their eyelids after they've breathed their last. It's an unforgettable, often holy feeling moment. But you know something? Not once, not once has a dying man or woman said to me, Pastor, would you please read to me once more a paragraph or two from the United States Constitution? Never! Read to me from God's Word? Yes. Pray prayers to God? Yes. Why? Because those are anchors dropped to us from heaven for us to cling on to. But some of you, look at you. You've gotten so wrapped up with the world's politics, you've, you've all but just cut all of those anchors. And it's distorted your perspective about that eternal kingdom where your true citizenship lies. And subsequently, you're depressed and despondent and fearful and angry and edgy and it's like you've been concussed. You're walking around dazed and you can't figure out why. I'll tell you why. It's because you've wrapped too many of your hopes up inextricably with this world and you've lost sight of that eternal city which is more and better than anything this world will ever provide and this is what James is reminding us of. But many of you, you're in affairs with the world and how could it be otherwise? You soak your minds for two hours and three and four hours a day with Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson and Rachel Maddow and Cuomo and countless other posts and articles on social media. But you don't soak your mind in the word of God for a counterbalancing two or three or four hours. I wonder, do you even spend two or three or four minutes in his word or in, his, in your prayer closet? pondering the goodness of God, reflecting on Him. Friends, God is not bound to the hopes or the despairs of any nation or leader. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others, Daniel 2.21 says. No nation is inherently righteous or divinely protected by merit or constitution or heritage. All you got to do to see that is just ask Israel and Judah of old who learned the hard way as Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonians closed in on them from the south and the Assyrians prior to that from the north. But even then, God was in on it. He was allowing his judgment to be enacted upon his own people. Why? because they'd grown so entwined with the world and they were proud of it. And this is why verse six, scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Come on now. <laughs> you know this, you know this. The quickest way for you to pick a fight with God, pride because he hates it. You wanna get chopped down like a tree, pride will get you there. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Because pride, see, pride cuts off the flow of grace and leaves God no option but to bring you down. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you and he wants you to be reawakened to your utter desperate need for him and for his grace without which you'll have no hope. Jesus, though Jesus rejected pride, 
And he always clung to the path of humility, making himself nothing and taking the form of a servant and coming into this sin-fallen world to live the life of sinlessness we couldn't so that he could die the death we deserve to the end that he might conquer the grave we would never conquer so that we could have life in that eternal kingdom. But only the humble come in, never the arrogant, nor the rude, nor the proud, for grace can only be received with knees bowed and hands opened and hearts filled with gratitude. So, what's James said so, uh, thus far? First of all, if there's fighting among the Christians, something's going wrong. When it's happening, you know somebody or some group of people have given their hearts over to the world. So what's the solution? That's the third and final thing for today. James 10, what's he say? Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. That's the third thing, humbly turn back to God. How? Well, look at verse seven. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. He's using this, this prophetic language. He's, he's coming on real strong here. Brothers and sisters, verse 11, do not slander one another. Who are you to judge one another? What's he saying? He's saying we'll never fix the problem out there if we don't get the problems fixed in here. So humble yourself, turn back to God, take off your helmet, take a deep breath. You're not the savior, surrender to him. Repent, turn around, turn back to the gospel. You say, but I am a gospel person, Ken. I am a believer. Well, then let us see your gospel outlook. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, hope for what lies before us. And if you're not a gospel person, step into his kingdom. It's the kingdom that will never end. For here, we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. So draw near to him. And he'll draw near to you. He's ready. He's waiting. At this time in history, friends, God needs free and open channels through whom he can pour out his power in you and I. We're meant to be that. Try, quit trying to get God to march to your cadence in your timing, your way. That's never gonna work. Humble yourself before him and let him lift you up. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. And besides, why get offended? You already have the love of the king of the universe. <laughs> Why would you begrudge others and resist forgiving them? You who've already been washed in his amazing grace. Speaking of amazing grace, John Newton, you know, the man who, who wrote that hymn. As a Christian several hundred years ago, he put it this way. Suppose a man was going to New York City to take possession of a large inheritance. And suppose his carriage should break down just one mile before he got to the city, necessitating his having to walk the final mile. What a fool we would think him to be if while walking that final mile to claim his inheritance, he was wringing his hands and blubbering out, oh, my carriage back there, my carriage is broken. And likewise, as you and I step through this fallen world towards that heavenly city, our inheritance which is yet to come. Let us not be people singing, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken. No, 
Let us believers be kingdom people, rising winsomely above the fray, singing about our eternal kingdom, and best of all, our King, whose grace has brought us safe thus far, and whose grace will lead us home. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder that you give to us. That really the problem isn't out there. The problem's in here. My prayer, Lord, is that every one of us would repent and surrender. Certainly those of us who have walked with you for years and have lost our perspective or cut those anchors from heaven and, and just got so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good anymore. Forgive us, Lord, turn us around. Rejuvenate our hearts. Fill us full of your Holy Spirit and with the fruit of your Spirit within us. And then, Lord, I pray for those who are watching, worshiping with us, who've said, you know, I don't think I've ever said yes, really, officially, in the first place to Jesus ever in my life. Today could be your day. And I invite you right now, you just pray something along these lines, Jesus, I need you to come into my life and transform me and change me and save me and turn me around and lift my eyes and my heart and my mind towards you and help me to see through a new lens, with new perspective, with new outlook and a new sense of purpose for my daily living. I wanna learn what it means to follow after you. Oh Lord, we need you, we need you, we need you. Won't you meet with us now? We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus.